I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Genevieve Matheson. I'm going to be sort of the moderator of this session. Um, rather than a traditional panel, we're going to be having each of our faculty participants presenting their experiences with Adobe Connect. So we're going to begin with Wyatt Newman, and we're going to then proceed with Lisa D'Amato and Gary Murphy. Uh, but we're going to start with a brief demonstration of how we use Adobe Connect, or how uh, Wyatt uses Adobe Connect in his classroom, for those of you who are not familiar with the technology, so you can see how, what it looks like and how it works. OK, good morning. I, um, I'm going to share with you my experience my first time using Adobe Connect has been this semester. And I use it in a, a somewhat odd way, but um, it, it easily segues into the, the distance capabilities. Uh, what I've been using it for is um, to teach a class in programming. And the, um, I've had some difficulty trying to teach this specific graphically oriented programming because there are lots of menus and there are lots of wires and things that uh, you can't really put on a static display. So I need to be able to show the class in higher resolution than is capable with a computer projector uh, what all the details are and I need to show them dynamically the construction as it takes place on my computer. Uh, so to get around, originally motivated just by the resolution problem of the camera and you know, students sitting in the back can't see the tiny wires and the, the specific motions I'm going through, I teach this in a classroom that has a bunch of workstations in it. The, computers, the students sit in front of their computers, they have nice widescreen LCDs there, and they join the meeting. So my classroom is actually live. Uh, but I also am conducting uh, an Adobe Connect meeting while they're present. So they all join the meeting and they get to see my desktop displayed on their screen and they still have room on the side to be able to follow along and to practice as I'm doing it. So it's kind of like, you know, sing along with the bouncing ball and they get to, oh, well that was dated. Oh, <laughs> and they get to see how it's done and how to, how to build while I'm constructing it. Uh, now, some of the extensions that I intend to use in the fall, uh, though I'm still naive about these, is that uh, I will be recording the lectures using the Adobe Connect capability. Uh, by turning on the webcam and on the microphone, uh, I can take the entire class and everything that's conducted in it and archive it. Uh, so I don't actually need a, a photographer present who's switching back and forth between screens and such. Uh, whatever takes place in that meeting can be completely archived and stored so the students can go back and review things from the lectures. I think it'll be handy. Now, at the same time, while students are joining the meeting locally, they could as well have been joining the meeting anywhere in the world. Uh, now, you do want a good high bandwidth connection to it or, or things can slow down uh, kind of abysmally. But, uh, Things continue to get faster, and lots of us are in high-speed connections, and so you really can conduct your class uh, in a distributed way. So now uh, Genevieve and I are going to do a live demonstration for you. I've, uh, I've uh, enabled the meeting that I have. I have a standing meeting set up for my class, Engineering 131, Introduction to Programming. Um, so now, uh, Genevieve, you'll open a browser. It, this requires, on the user's side, this requires no special software. Um, there's a, a small amount of uh, software you have to install if you're going to be an originator of a meeting. So I'm the host for the meeting and I've originated this meeting. Um, and so Genevieve's brought up uh, just an arbitrary browser, doesn't matter which one you use. And she has to then surf over to the website now that corresponds to my meeting. Now, as the originator of a meeting, uh, there's this really easy form that you fill out. It says, what would you like your website to be? But it's going to start with our case preamble. So she'll type in connect.case.edu. So this is uh, Adobe Connect, uh, but the case website will be hosting it. And then slash for my particular meeting is the class name ENGR131 which was already taken, so I had to put my initials after it, WSN. Okay, so uh, the students memorized this pretty quickly, and when they come in, they all start connecting to my meeting. Uh, so at this point, you can enter your name. Now, I could restrict the membership of this meeting to a specific roster, uh, but I didn't really see any need for that, and I just left it open. I do, though, uh, leave on the, the bit where I accept or decline them joining the meeting. I could turn that off and just say, whoever wants to join can join. Uh, so Genevieve has just connected in, uh, one more button press to join the meeting, and she should be there. Now, I am sharing my desktop right now, and so what will show up on here is what's on my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to accept her there. You've been accepted. Um, 
So now that Genevieve has been accepted to the meeting, my desktop is showing up on her screen. Now, she'll get the video feed on the left, but, and that other video feed is actually what I'm seeing on my screen. Okay, so uh, uh, this will allow me actually to show you some of the buttons. Um, I can change some of the specifications here. If you go to slow images, that'll work better for slow internet connections. Uh, I can change the, the audio on here. I've currently turned the voice off, otherwise we'll get feedback in this room. Uh, so I've turned the microphone off. Uh, so you can see how the host can change these sorts of things. And if, uh, if Genevieve raises her hand, you can see she's joined the meeting. Over here, it shows that I can see who's present. Uh, and if she wants to say something, then uh, go ahead and ask. Now, you see on my screen here, it says, Genevieve has raised hand. Uh, so I will approve. There, you're accepted and approved. <clears throat> Which means I now have the right to speak in the meeting, or in your case, probably in real life. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now the, uh, I'll show you then some how I use it for the teaching. Um, I'm done with the setup for the Adobe Connect, and what I want to display here is uh, how we go about doing graphical programming in LabVIEW. Come now. All right, so I open up um, a new program, and the programming here takes place by going through a sequence of uh, palettes and icons and wires. So I, I need to show them where to find these things. Now in the, the projection there, we're losing a bit of the advantage since I was using Adobe Connect primarily for the higher resolution, and now we're displaying it with the computer projector, and there goes the resolution. So it, you kind of have to squint and imagine that you're in front of a computer terminal. Uh, so I grab a button, and I can put it on the desktop. So you can see how hard that would be to try to hand wave and explain. Uh, but if you're staring at your computer screen, then you can see what's going on. And not only that, you would be able to uh, set up your own window on the side and follow along and build your own program. And you know, you can raise your hand and or ask a question online about, uh, or, or if you're physically present, just shout it out about. Whoa, whoa, where was that again? I missed it. Uh, and the, the the front panel here now has two graphical items, and this is how you program in LabVIEW, which is why I really need this this interactive and high resolution display. Uh, there's a little tiny icon on here that you can probably hardly see on the screen, which looks like a spool of wire. And then you click and drag over to wire these items together. All right, I've just written a program. Uh, and I'll go ahead and run that program. It's a silly little program. When I turn on, when I push this button, it turns on a light. Okay, I turn it off. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first program that I teach them. You can see how difficult this would be to try to hand wave about. It has to be dynamic. They have to see the process of the wiring, of going through the hierarchies. And they need to be able to see the fine detail of, of some of these little structures on here. Uh, you can barely see, uh, perhaps you cannot. Um, there's a little triangle on here pointing out, which means this is an output port. And it's available for wiring to another input port. I'll go ahead and grab a couple more things in there. Um, so I'll take a slider and bring it onto the front panel. And I'll grab, I think I will, grab a meter. So you have to be able to see where these lie in the hierarchy of the palettes. Uh, and since this is all graphical, you, you really want quality graphics in front of you. Uh, and now the slider has an output available for wiring, and the meter has an input available. So I can run this. Now I've written my second program where I can still toggle the LED. Uh, and I can also move my slider and see it show up on the meter. Okay, Not so interesting just yet, uh, but we can start introducing the concept of loops. Uh, so under the programming palette, I grab a while loop. And I'll turn this whole thing into a while construction. The termination condition, I'll add to it a control, which means a button. Now look, a button just showed up on my front panel when I did that. Uh, and I can decide how fast I want it to run. So I go under the timing palette, I bring in a metronome, and I tell it, let's do this every 100 milliseconds. So that's how fast this will run. So they're already getting a concept of timing in the program, but you see everything is graphical. And, and so the ability to project what's happening, happening dynamically in high resolution is essential to be able to, to teach this. Yeah, I tried learning it out of a textbook, 
right? And it, it just doesn't take. You have to watch the process. Uh, so it's, now I'll go ahead and run this program, and I should still have my button working, and my slider works. It's just not gobbling up as much CPU time now. Uh, I can illustrate that um, by showing the performance meter, and you see that instead of gobbling up all the CPU time, we're now only using a, a tiny slice of it. Uh, one more piece, and, and that'll be the end of today's lesson in programming. Uh, <laughs> let's bring in here, oh, I can use my stop button now. Let's bring in here a graph. Put that on there. And to have something interesting to graph, uh, I'll put that inside the loop so it happens on every iteration. And I will include a random number generator, perhaps not the most interesting thing to graph, but it'll give you, if you were hooked up to an instrument, uh, which we do in the labs, then you would actually get real data coming out on the graph here. So we'll go ahead and run that one. And we see random numbers coming out here while we continue to be able to, to move our meter and turn our LED off and on. All right, so that's an example of how I use Connect to teach programming. Uh, the, uh, the specific features that I need are the ability to show the process. It's very dynamic. They have to see how you bring things in, how you wire things together, where you grab things, what it looks like while it's running. Uh, so all of that has to be done as, as a, a, a dynamic display. Uh, and as you can tell from your poor resolution, uh, high resolution is an important thing. Also, if it has been taught in this fashion, where you watch someone do it, uh, and you can't really go back to a textbook to, uh, to review how to do that, uh, you can uh, go back to the archive meeting and watch it again. So uh, for things that are taught best by a movie, it's very handy to have a, an Adobe Connect session. Uh, so I've used up my time, I think. And that's <laughs> we'll probably have some time to come back to that. Uh, so Wyatt's use of Adobe Connect is is, is classroom-based. But in stark contrast to that, uh, Lisa D'Amato. I see someone in the audience just asked to join the meeting. Is there someone on a laptop out there? Is <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been accepted. You're now in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> In stark contrast to this in-person face-to-face interaction, though, Lisa D'Amato used Adobe Connect for distance learning and has a very different uh, use for the product and it's different experience. Would you like to sit at the computer? Okay. All right, you got your stuff here. Let me just put up my stuff here. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Lisa D'Amato, and I'm um, an associate professor at the School of Nursing. And um, my, um, my little uh, entree into Adobe Connect occurred um, in January. Um, we, um, just to give you a little bit of background on this, um, we have uh, what we call intensive courses offered at the School of Nursing. And these are um, sort of a format of squashing all the didactic face-to-face -face classroom time of a regular three credit hour semester course into a, a one week period, usually six days, um, in which uh, students come in for six days, get all the content, usually their assignments are due throughout the rest of the semester. Um, and it's a helpful format for our uh, graduate students, particularly because many of them are working. Um, so for our, our master's students, um, it's easier for them to ask for a week off of time from the hospital um, when they're working um, because then, you know, it's just easier than trying to ask for every Tuesday off, you know, if a class met, you know, for three hours or whatever during a regular semester for 14 weeks. Um, we sometimes use this for our uh, undergraduate students for um, selected courses. And all, certainly all the master's courses are not offered that way. But one of our programs, our Doctor of Nursing Practice program, offers all of its courses in that manner. And so it's become a very attractive option for students from all over the country. In January, I had students here from California, um, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC, um, you know, New York City, so you name it. And it's easy for them to come out, you know, pay for a hotel room, a plane flight, get, kind of get all their didactic in, and then the rest of the semester they can do the work and uh, hand in their assignments and so forth. So um, due to the teaching loads of the regular uh, faculty during the regular semester and the fact that we probably would never be able to get classroom space and uh, block it off for an entire week of time during the regular semester, these courses are always offered before the 
start of the regular semester. So we usually offer two weeks of courses um, prior to the start of each term, mid-August for the fall term, early January for the spring term, and mid-May for the summer term. Where we kind of get um, cramped for time is in the January one. And I know one year we just didn't have enough time between January 2nd and the start of the regular semester because there just weren't enough days in terms of when the university started up for the uh, spring term. And in fact, um, I know it happened a couple of years ago and we just offered one week of course and that's sort of one week of courses. And so that sort of caught us off guard um, in terms of keeping our students on target with um, their uh, program of study. So this time it happened again in January. There were only 10 days available. And you know, we include Saturday and Sunday. We go six days in a row. So um, this time there were only 10 days available. So they wanted to be able to offer two sessions of courses, but it meant that we each could have only five days. So because students are paying for a three credit hour course, they really needed to get the same amount of face-to-face -face classroom instruction from the um, faculty member um, because they were basically paying for that. So we had to become creative in terms of finding a way to make up that missed last day. And so because I was teaching one of these courses this time, um, I went ahead and um, was pretty much motivated to learn how to do Adobe Connect because <laughs> normally I just say, oh, I don't have time for that learning curve, you know. <laughs> I'll just keep doing things my usual way. But um, this time, I, you know, I had to come up with a way. And, you know, although I had used Blackboard extensively in the past, my use of Blackboard was primarily as a way to post the syllabus, um, post helpful resources for students, post handouts. I really never used it for interactive classroom instruction using the discussion board. So I was going to have to learn one of them, and it made sense to me to use the one that was probably the newer technology. So. Um, I started out by uh, knowing this was coming. I started out in November releasing the syllabus, and we had students enrolled in the course and warning them that there were going to be two, or excuse me, three days, um, in, two in March and one in April, where there were going to be these mandatory web sessions um, in hopes that they'd be able to arrange for the time off from work um, if they had enough advance notice. And, and many hospitals, you know, you have a three month schedule that goes out, so you don't have a lot of time to, um, you know, ask for days off at the last minute. So um, I, I started out with that. I had a faculty member come to um, my office in December. Uh, Chris Hudak is uh, the person that teaches in our um, nursing informatics program. And she was one of the um, selected faculty last fall who was trained for Adobe Connect before it was um, really out there for widespread use by faculty. Um, and so she came and sat in my office for about two and a half hours and walked me through the, the, you know, helped me load the software, walked me through everything, and sort of showed me everything it could do, and I was totally overwhelmed. <laughs> I just couldn't absorb it all, and thought, oh my god, what am I going to do? I'm going to look like an idiot when I have to do this for my students. So, um, you know, I just sort of went back to, um, you know, figuring out we'd, we'd make this work somehow, and, and maybe I would catch on as I actually had to use it, as opposed to watching somebody do it for me. Um, when the students came in January, I'd warn them to try to bring their laptops um, on a particular day to the class. Uh, most of them do come with laptops anyway for that week so that they can work while they're um, in Cleveland for the week. And, um, you know, try to get, encourage them to buy headsets. Um, and with the help of uh, Shelley Snyder from our um, IT department at the School of Nursing, we kind of pointed them in the direction of some um, quality um, but yet not too expensive headsets that they could use um, in, and buy either on the internet or in their local office supply store. And so they, um, Chris came to the class one day for about an hour and a half and demonstrated to the students. We set up a, a cyber classroom um, while we were in the class, kind of showed students how they access the site, how they get in, how they raise their hand and so forth. So very, very basic things. Now, Unfortunately, um, none of the students really came with a headset that day, and you know I didn't think that was going to be a big deal, but it actually turned out to be a bigger deal. <laughs> um, you know, sort of playing with all of the the software necessary and all of the parts necessary. Um, that sort of tripped us up when we held our first um, our first session. Um, so anyway, the students all went home um, in January, and we um, uh, I started worrying about you know, early March when I was going to have to do this. Now, another faculty colleague of mine also tried to do the same thing, and she went ahead and held a session, I think, in February, and um, she pretty much had a disastrous experience. <laughs> she couldn't, she couldn't, um, she didn't understand that you had to 
hold the button down on the on the microphone t for everyone to hear you throughout the whole time you were talking, or else you had to hit the um, whatever that thing, the hands free, so that it would ca carry um, her voice, you know, consistent with the, without remembering to keep the the clicker pressed on the on the software. And um, so she couldn't, students couldn't hear, and everybody just kept raising their hand saying, I can't hear you. And, um, you know, um, so she ended up typing most of her lecture, and she's a hunt and peck typer. So this, <laughs> this was not pretty. Um, <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I was determined that I wasn't going to have the same thing happen. And so I got pretty motivated to do a, a lot of practice sessions. And um, uh, I had several practice sessions with Shelly Snyder. Um, in the School of Nursing, she'd be in the second floor in her office. Um, in one end of the building, I was in the third floor in my office. Sometimes we'd have my, my faculty colleague who had the bad experience because she had to do it again later in the semester. And so she practiced with us. Um, occasionally other um, IT support people from the School of Nursing would join in. Um, what was helpful was Shelly could sit in her office and remote into my screen from in my office as long as my laptop was docked. And she would... Um, she would do that and sort of show me, no, no, this is where you have to click. And we had our telephones on so we could still speak to each other and not worry about the fact that maybe we couldn't pick up each other through the headsets. So um, that was very helpful. Um, and so, you know, we got some practice with that. And um, I actually um, also set up times with my family. Um, <laughs> I had my kids in different rooms of the house with a laptop and headset, you know, and we were like, Mom, can you hear me, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it worked, and I had my, you know, husband in, in the computer room with his headset and my kids, and we even had, um, we remoted into my uh, colleague Donna, who was in Shaker Heights that evening at 8 o'clock at night, and, you know, so we got lots of practice, and I think that was really key, because um, eventually in March, um, I was able to go ahead and um, have that. Um, I, I tried to use the online tutorials um, that were in the Adobe Connect um, uh, site in terms of how to use it. And you know, I started out with those. Um, and I don't know if I clicked the wrong thing, or eventually my screen didn't look like what the screenshots did in the, <laughs> in the tutorials. And I, so I got a little frustrated with that. But um, in working with Shelly, as, as we went through our practice sessions, I was sort of jotting down my own you know, Adobe Connect for Dummies cheat sheet, um, and kind of wrote those out. And those helped me as I had to set up my meeting. And I shared them with my colleague, who found, found that those were very useful. I mean, you have to think about the fact that the average age of a nurse these days is 48. Many of our doctoral students are in their mid to late 40s, um, sometimes even early 50s. And so we're not as computer savvy as the average college student, um, particularly in the graduate program. And you know, you might think that we use computers in the hospital, but quite honestly, they're, they're pretty point and click. They, you know, you look up lab values. You really don't compose anything on a computer. It's not the same as using a computer. It's sort of accessing information is, is probably the extent of most hospitals until we get more into electronic health records, which, you know, certainly we're going that direction. But um, mo many of us don't know how to do that as, as well as other students do. Um, I also developed an instruction sheet for students um, sort of on microphone etiquette, uh, talking them through, and I sent this to them a couple days before the, the um, scheduled meeting, talking them through how to access the site, uh, what to do when they get on there, um, how to check if it's working, um, how to raise their hand if they needed to ask me something or couldn't hear me, how to chat, put, uh, type that into the chat box and let me know. Um, so that was, um, I think, very helpful. Shelly attended my first uh, class web session. Uh, she remoted in as a host and was able to sort of help me through. If, if people said they couldn't uh, hear, she would do private chats with me and let me know what I could do to solve the problem. Or she would talk privately to the student to say, you know, click this on your own computer. And a lot of the students just didn't even know how to work with their own equipment at home. They didn't know how to make the microphone work on their own laptop. You know, and when they're in Pennsylvania, it's kind of hard to help them through that, you know, unless you know enough about computers to walk them through some of those troubleshooting things. Um, the um, pros and cons, um, in general, I think the students felt it worked very well. Um, they told me that it went pretty smoothly for the first time. Um, maybe they were just trying to, you know, mosey on up for a better grade, but <laughs> they did tell me they liked it. Um, uh, it probably took us 20 minutes the first time to get everybody 
uh, signed into the class and make sure everyone could hear. There was one student who's just in Texas who just couldn't make it work to hear, and so um, I called her on my um, telephone from my office and put it on speaker so she could hear the whole thing. And halfway through the um, meeting, she was able to make her equipment work so she could hear through the headset. So it was something she needed to work, about, work out with um, her own equipment. Um, I did a second uh, session that Shelly signed in on the beginning. She wasn't able to stay for the entire two hours, but um, you know, we did find once we got started and things went much more smoothly the second time. Um, the recording session was very helpful. Although every one of the students made it to the first session, the second session um, there were just students who could not get uh, their patients rescheduled. Many of them are nurse practitioners and they have a patient panel that they see. They couldn't reschedule their patients. Some of them. Uh, teach in nursing schools. They couldn't get anyone else to uh, take their student group to clinical that day, and so they had to miss it. And uh, the recorded session was very helpful for them to go back and hear it on, uh, later on. So they appreciated that ability. Um, the last time uh, I I used it, I did sort of four-day question and answer thing, and used it more like a discussion board. Um, just using the chat feature and I said, you know, if you have questions about um, your final assignment in the course, send me, um, send me your question, post it so everyone can see it because you tend to always have uh, similar questions or many people have the same question as you. And then I would type back a response. Um, what I learned from that is that the, the chat box must have a limit on the number of characters you can put in because they would ask a short question, but I would give them this long-winded answer in attempts to sort of make the answer apply to what I thought everybody was doing because I kind of knew about everyone's projects and I knew how this answer may apply to uh, this student and that student. So I tried to give more of a global answer or to address several different examples. So I'd type the whole thing out and then I'd hit post and only half of it would be there, you know? And so I thought, oh, I must have accidentally hit send or something. And so I would type it again and finish typing it. And after it happened about the third time, I was like, duh, it must have a, a character limit here. So um, I learned that you, you know, if you're gonna type a long-winded answer, you have to put it in sections, otherwise you're retyping a lot. Um, the negative student feedback, primarily a lot of them just didn't have the headsets, um, even the last time, um, you know, by the last time we used it. And so that, you know, that they recognized was their own uh, limitation. It would have been helpful, helpful to have practiced with the headsets um, that day that they were there in January. Um, and the fact that, you know, they didn't have on-site troubleshooting if they didn't even know how to work their own equipment at home. And I think, you know, if you can plan ahead for that and make sure they have headsets available, which I think over time will be less and less of an issue. Um, in terms of future plans, um, I think this provides options for planned faculty absences. I know I'm going to be teaching one of these courses in August, and I cannot be there for the last day of the session. Um, the course runs from Monday through Saturday, and the second course does Sunday through the following, I think, Friday. And um, I'm going to be out of town for that weekend, so I'm basically missing the last day of a course that I'm scheduled to teach, so I'm going to make up the time on Adobe Connect. Um, the students in our uh, Doctor of Nursing Practice program uh, write a doctoral thesis. Um, although they do do their final defense in person on campus, they can get approval for their project when they go ahead to start um, the conduct of the project. That they can have always done uh, remotely by phone for the most part if they're, if they're out of the area, which is probably over half of our students. And, um, in the past, what we've done is set up a conference telephone call and the faculty member will sit there with their computer and just advance the pre-distributed um, PowerPoints file. So, and the student would say, you know, would do their little presentation, say, okay, next slide, and everybody would move their slides ahead on their own computer. Um, I think Adobe Connect will be a nice way of doing this um, in the future. Um, I know Greg Graham, one of the faculty members at the School of Nursing who um, teaches our uh, statistics for our um, Doctor of Nursing practice students. He has used um, Adobe Connect for help sessions when students need help with their, um, the statistics part of their uh, thesis. And when we were here in um, January, we had an incredibly snowy day on one of the um, days of the um, 
of the session, and we had tentatively set up an Adobe Connect session for <laughs> Saturday in case we all couldn't get in. Um, actually, all but one student got in, but um, you know, I live 26 miles away from campus, so you know, getting in is not. You know, I can appreciate the fact that it's not easy for people to get in, and when we have students who live. Um, down in Holmes County, they don't often will drive up for the day for the class. They will not stay overnight. So, you know, that's a long way for them to drive up. So, I think that's pretty much my presentation. And um, I guess we're going to do questions at the end. Yeah, we're going to do questions at the end. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. You can stay. I'll just. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Gary Murphy, who actually merges the two with an on campus class that he then uses Adobe Connect for um, sort of more distance interaction. I'll let Gary explain. Sure. Thanks, Genevieve. Um, so I, I feel a little uh, like a fish out of water here. Uh, my, you know, sort of esteemed colleagues uh, are much more organized than I am. I, I'm more of a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person. Um, so I've, I've used Adobe Connect in, in sort of two primary capacities. Um, and they're very different. So one is uh, an undergraduate principles of microeconomics exam, uh, exam review session. So, you know, I normally have in class lecture, chalk and talk, and, you know, you try and throw in the latest uh, pedagogy sort of gadget here and there. Um, and I've run lots and lots of techno disaster experiments in the past, <laughs> um, some, with, some with success and some, and some without. I should occasionally successful. Um, because I'm in the business school, uh, I also have sort of a side gig. You know, as people in the business school, we sort of just do enough teaching to sort of give us an office, and then on the, on the side, we've got other businesses going. Um, sorry. <laughs> this is recorded, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I actually do uh, some informal advising to uh, Local nonprofits and and a, and a few friends who have businesses around the place, um, and I've found Adobe Connect to be to be useful for that. Um, so two very different settings. I'll, I'll primarily talk about the undergraduate uh, exam review session, uh, and if we have enough time, I'll sort of mention the uh, mention these informal client meetings. Um, to give you a bit of background, uh, I've been here six years. I teach uh, both in the undergraduate, primarily in the undergraduate program. Uh, but also occasionally in our MBA program. Um, and I am not, I'm no Wyatt. I'm no computer savvy type person. I like to play with technology, but that's about, that's about the extent of it. Um, so to give you a bit of background about my exam review, um, it's a principles microeconomics class. I assume, and, and I'm quite confident, Genevieve probably has numbers that Almost 100% of my undergraduate students have a computer at in their dorm room or at home and uh, broadband internet access. So no students have, have complained or protested that oh, I can't, can't get access to the exam review session. Um, the way I set up the Adobe Connect uh, session, um, as Wyatt showed you, uh, I simply use this laptop here. It has a webcam in it. Uh, it has a, a microphone built in, which I found to be totally sufficient. Um, I am the only one who has microphone ability, and all the students in my class are forced to dialogue via the public chat. Now, there's lots and lots of uh, other options in Adobe Connect to have students post uh, privately questions to, to the instructor. Um, but seeing as I didn't really spend any time learning the technology, I didn't realize that. Um, which actually works out to be, there's a sort of a serendipitous outcome to this, uh, which, I, which I'll get to in a moment. So students are all forced to, to post their questions uh, via chat. Um, I, just as, just as I would in a normal exam review session in a classroom, stand silently, uh, sit, but silently, waiting for them to ask a question. Well, what, what, do you want, what do you want me to talk about? We've been through lecture, um, and they're forced to, to use the chat function to do that. So the reason I did this was uh, I didn't want to use uh, class time for an exam review session, um, but I did want it to make it uh, as accessible as possible to students. Um, I 
could make it on the weekends, I could make it on, in, in the evenings. There was always going to be some scheduling conflict for our overly scheduled students, uh, varsity athletes and people who work and stuff. So I thought, well, you know, I'll make, it, I'll make it online, even though the vast majority of students in my class live on campus in dorms, um, even still, it's inconvenient in the evenings to have them walking across campus to get to a single room for a one hour session. I just figured this would be a fun experiment to try. Um, I also thought that the archiving function would be, would be useful, that students who couldn't make that particular live session could go back and, and watch it. I'm really skeptical about the, uh, the learning benefits of students watching recorded sessions. Um, but they give me positive uh, feedback for providing them. They feel like they've learnt something uh, and they write nice evaluations that I've been so considerate <laughs> as to. Um, but uh, I, I've not seen any good research on, on, the, on the learning outcomes from, from that. Um, so that was my original motivation. I thought, well, schedule and convenience, archiving. For you who are practitioners, um, just point out that selling students at the start of the semester about, well, you know, I kind of think this will be good for you because of this, this, and this, and yeah, it's kind of an experiment and it may fail, um, is a really, really handy way to buy a lot of goodwill. Um, I, and like I said, I've, made, I've had some colossal failures. Um, I've had undergraduate students writing collaborative online wiki textbooks and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, but telling them that it's an experiment and that you really appreciate their efforts and hey, yeah, this doesn't really seem to be working out, sorry about that, seemingly doesn't affect my teaching evaluations. Um, <laughs> so, you know, go figure. Um, so anyway, uh, so here's the unexpected outcome. So serendipitously, I found out that, um, that the chat that was going on was really productive. So I would, I would ask a rhetorical question. Um, okay, so someone's brought up a, a particular topic. I would start explaining using graphs. I've got my microphone on, so I'm sort of giving a monologue while drawing a graph that, that sort of explains the, the, the concept. At the same time, the chat continued on and students were asking each other questions and answering each other's questions in a way that's not possible in, in a classroom, right? So, you know, you can't have students talking while I'm talking, that's, you know, <laughs> offensive or, or at, least, at least inconvenient for the other students who are trying to listen. Um, so this to me was sort of a, a phenomenon I hadn't seen before and I thought it was really, really cool. Um, so to give, you, to give you, this is just a screenshot, so I'm not set up to, to, to play this dynamically. So this is the sort of thing I do, and, I, and because I'm doing it in real time, I haven't, I, I don't know what questions students are going to ask, I'm, I'm just trying to draw in graphs and things as, as we're going. I used uh, this uh, whiteboard function kind of a lot in the, in the exam review session, as opposed to White's um, sharing his desktop where he could use lots of other programs um, you know, the particular lab view software and students could view that. I'm just using uh, Adobe Connect's whiteboard. Um, so the, you know, some student asks a question, this looks like uh, negative externalities in uh, principles microeconomics. I start drawing away, typing in, and what I'm interested in showing you is this, is this chat box. So this is the actual chat box from, from, um, fr from the class, and so I'd posted a question, where there were some numbers uh, there, and students started sending in their answers. And, and you'll notice, these are, these are the students' real names. Um, so Naraj and Spencer, real students, they use, their, they use their real names. They didn't have to, but they did. Um, and as you can see, someone's wrong, right? Because the, number, the numbers don't all match up, um, you know. Uh, yeah, producer surplus, whoop, oh, hang on, sorry. Uh, so you see that Spencer's got a PS equal to 1,840, uh, whereas Naraj has a PS equal of 800. Spencer realizes his mistake. Other students are already commenting on, on his mistake. I think he might have made an error here. Um, 
And, and what, what I find in my discipline, I don't know whether this is universal across disciplines, um, for economics, it's a highly intuitive discipline, right? We've, we've all bought and sold things. We sort of know about capitalism and stuff. Um, and so I get a lot of head nodding in class. Uh-huh, uh-huh, get it, all right, pollution, bad, tax it, whatever. Um, <laughs> but the, there's a big disconnect between students' intuitive understanding of the discipline and their ability to apply theory. And so I'm constantly challenged to get students to engage with that theory, to test themselves, to test themselves, you know, do I really understand why the curve is shaped that way? Could I, could I solve the, 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 the algebraic uh, function to, to calculate the optimal outcome? Um, this kind of stuff. Um, and that's a real challenge. And so what I've found doing this is that um, students, are, students are thinking constantly. So he, he, here's basically what, what, are some, what are some of the outcomes. One, I should pre preface all of the outcomes by saying there's ob an obvious sampling bias here, right? The students who are signing up and attending these exam review sessions online are students who like to hang out online, presumably. I don't know. Um, so the interpretation of this outcome is generalizable, completely untested, and I've not seen any literature on any of this about a, a, a quality controlled experiment on this. So, um, the attendance is approximately equal to what I've experienced in previous semesters, online versus the in-class session. What I don't know is the, the makeup. Are we attracting somehow students who would not otherwise come to review sessions? Uh, are these the same students? Are these... Mm, ha, ha. I also have no testable outcomes on, on student learning. So all those students said it was really fun and all those students said, you know, that, that was really productive. I don't know whether that helped their learning at all. Um, I should say uh, one, one easily observable outcome it was as effortless uh, for students to adopt the technology. Uh, there was no learning curve at all. Um, and there was really minimal effort by the instructor. And uh, th 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 this, this part I know to be true. Um, so so in, terms of, in terms of my, my use, I, um, I set up, uh, I, I saw this technology once. I started playing around with it. It was hard to sort of get a sense of what you could do by yourself. A colleague in my department also is a bit of a techno gadget geek. And I said, hey, have you, have you checked out this thing? And we started playing around with it for 15, 20 minutes, and that was kind of it. Um, so I don't know all the additional functionality. Uh, I kind of picked that up a little bit after the first exam review session. Uh, but hey, it was an experiment, and we're all learning. Um, so this I found to be really, really uh, easy. So um, here's my intuition. The Facebook user community has no problem adopting this technology. What's amazing to me is that um, students used their real name and posted their answers and questions without shame. <laughs> which, which to me, I mean, it's almost easier in a classroom for me. So, oh, I don't know, this might be a dumb question, but, um, or, or to look like, I know other students might be questioning like this thing. Uh, whereas students in the chat using their real name knowing that other students had posted a different solution to the rhetorical question, still posted their solutions, which is a complete anathema to me. Um, so I, th I thought that was, that was fascinating. Um, so uh, another aspect here, I thought this is a really high stimulus environment. And so, um, so students are, they're listening to me, they're watching this graph being assembled in real time, they're chatting to each other about either that question or the previous question or some other question. Um, but it's, there's a lot going on and it's all related to the content that I want them to think about. As opposed to in lecture, um, they're looking up from their laptops, okay, got it, and then, and then they're back to updating their Facebook profile, or I, I, I don't know what they do. I, I'm always making fun of them. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not, I'm not a demographer. If the incidence of ADD is on the rise or whatever, or, or whether we're just training people to be better multitaskers, um, ADD sounds so negative. You know, 
Maybe it's a good thing, right? People, short attention spans, multitasking all the time. Um, you know, can we, can we better utilize that? Great, you want to multitask all the time? Is this, if, if I'm not efficiently teaching you right now and you could sort of be more efficiently learning by partially listening to me and reading the chapter of that thing you didn't really understand, great. Um, Gary, I'm afraid we are just about out of time. Oh my goodness, all right. <laughs> Um, look, obviously the other, the other points here, uh, invites peer instruction, invites students to, to test themselves. Did I post the correct answer or, or am I wrong? Um, in comparison, my client meetings, um, again, it was effortless adoption so long as they weren't, so long as my clients weren't leading the presentation. Um, so, so I thought there was some, uh, a significant disconnect there. Uh, so they, they find it very easy. Uh, I did see that a lot of um, WebEx, if people are familiar with WebEx, the online conferencing uh, tool, uh, a number of my clients have used WebEx many times before and just liked the flexibility of, of Adobe Connect. And I thought that was, so that I got plenty of wow and compliments and that's always good for the ego. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what I, what I experienced. Well, thank you very much, all of you. I, I don't know if we have time for a question. No, we do not have time for any questions. I'm sorry for that. Uh, we had a lot of content to cover and we got through it, but barely. So thank you all for, your, uh, for attending this morning. And uh, if you have any questions after the session, please feel free to come up and grab us. Thank you.